broken system. Whose fault is it? <laughs> Why did we end up in this mess? Who's to blame? Is it that simple? Are we to condemn corporations? Are we going to boycott? Or is it up to individuals not to adopt destructive behaviors such as overconsumption and purchasing their items from fast fashion groups? Looking at the data, we are seeing an increase in the adoption of sustainable fabric, for example, uh, for example, some of the fabrics that uh, recycled cotton, um, tencel, and so on. Volumes of sustainable fabrics are being used. In fact, it has grown 19.7% year on year. And on the other hand, 81% of consumers say they will make personal sacrifices to address social and environmental issues. But yet the system is still broken. So let's find out how we can unbreak it. Please welcome Frauke, Jennifer from ICO, Frauke from G Star Raw, Jennifer from ICO, Maya from uh, a TED speaker, Christine uh, from Madison's Innovative Materials, and it will be moderated by Whitney, assistant editor at Fashionista. Thank you. Hi y'all, how you doing? You still awake? We awake? <laughs> so I'm Whitney Bauk. I'm a little froggy because I'm a, I'm a bit sick, so bear with me with my voice. But um, as Celine said, I'm an assistant editor at Fashionista. So we're a fashion news website and I write news about anything, but my interest has been in sustainability and ethics in the fashion industry for a long time. And I'm gonna get, let everyone on the panel just take a little bit about who you are and what you do to get an intro. Sorry, I've got a little show and tell, so that's why I'm over here. I'm um, Jennifer Gilbert. I'm a Chief Marketing Officer at ICO, which is short for iCollect, and we're a global solutions provider for um, apparel and footwear, for the collection of it, for the sorting of it, and for the reuse and recycling of it. And our key commitment is to create a circular, circular economy, which you've probably been hearing about, um, for the fashion industry. And um, I'm glad to be here. And thanks so much, Celine, G-Star, everyone for having me. Hi, my name is Maya Penn. I am 18 years old and I'm CEO of Maya's Ideas, which is a sustainable fashion company. I started in 2008. Um, I create eco-friendly clothing and accessories and I also speak and do a lot of education about sustainability and sustainable fashion. Um, I've given three TED Talks about sustainability. Um, I've also uh, written a book and I have my own nonprofit organization called Maya's Ideas for the Planet and I've also received a, uh, a combination from President Barack Obama and the EPA this was in 2016 for my environmental work and I, I'm really trying to my my overall goal is to really uh, educate uh, especially young people about sustainability and, and how uh, they can really use their, where they put their time and their energy and their dollars um, to make a, a difference in our planet and how sustainability is for everyone. And so that's, uh, that's why I'm really excited to be here and be a part of this amazing panel. say with you <laughs> next to me. Uh, my name is Frauke Bruinsma uh, and I work for G-Star. I'm uh, at G-Star, I'm heading the sustainability department now for 15 years. Uh, G-Star is uh, next year we will celebrate our 30th birthday and uh, G-Star is all about denim uh, and uh, innovation and sustainability are really at the core of our uh, business and in our DNA. Um, we're known for raw denim, piece what I'm wearing, and also 3D uh, techniques. Um, and our, um, what we really want to do is to explain you that uh, companies can be sustainable and you can still uh, uh, make a profit in a way, because that's your existence, because you need to sell something, but we can do it in a sustainable way. Outside, I hope you've seen it as a, we've sh a showpiece of uh, our denim craftsmanship of our company. Um, where we want to show you that yeah, we can make we make beautiful stuff with denim um, made of our cradle to cradle gold uh, denim certified fabric. Um, thank you for all being here on a Sunday. Uh, up to you. Thank you. Um. 
one of my favorite companies, by the way, back in Europe, when I used to live in Europe, I loved Gistara 30 years ago. So my name is Christine Opusleyer. I'm the founder of consulting firm Madison's Innovative Materials. Uh, I'm a researcher, I'm an educator, presenter, lecturer, and I'm also the founder and manager of the Innovative Textile and Materials Department at FIDM, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. It's a public library, so please come and visit me anytime. So we have a quite an amazing collection that I've been, yeah, what, um, acquiring materials for the past 10 years. And so I'm very happy to be here and discuss the future of fashion. Thank you. So we're going to jump into our discussion, but I did just want to say, if we have time at the end, we would love to allow for questions. So as you're listening, if there are things that come up that you're like, oh, they're not really answering that, hold on to it, and we'll come back to you at the end. Um, so we're going to start with a really easy, small question, which is, who's responsible for all the bad things that are happening in our industry? <laughs> Real chill. Uh, I'm, 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 I'll start. <laughs> I feel uh, it's on my industry, but it's also, your, also yours. I, yes. um, I think what we've built, of course, is a, is a whole take, make and dispose uh, system, which we've built all together, not only the businesses, but also as a consumer, I'm also a consumer of a customer. So we are kind of all responsible. Maybe it's not so nice to say, but I think we can hold everybody responsible for what we've built. Uh, and next to that, there's a whole new, um, what happened to the world. The world has become so fast. Digital, the digital revolution has brought us many different things. So consumers are shopping online. Uh, you don't go a lot to brick and mortar stores anymore. Um, uh, you want to have your product very fast and uh, so we have all new things or new ways of how we want to buy a product um, so all together I, I feel we're really all uh, responsible and as a company we want to take our responsibility to try to solve it which of course you also need everybody also in this room within the world to help to solve it again um, I'll jump into exactly uh, it's Right now we're in an economy, it's called a linear economy, and that linear economy is we take resources off the planet, we make things, we use them, and then we toss them away and then buy more. So that is very, very harmful to the environment, and not until recently has the industry really taken that on to say we're going to make products that are reusable and recyclable and really think about that in design from the beginning. And then on the consumer side, not a lot of thought for all of us has gone into what do we do with the clothes when we, and shoes and other textiles when we don't want them any longer. And the majority is really going into our landfills incineration. The, um, uh, the latest report from the EPA is saying that in the U.S. alone, it adds up to 27 billion pounds going into our landfills incineration. And the sad thing with that is 95% or more of it is reusable and recyclable. So it's amazing raw material that we really need to continue to, to farm and, and give it as a feedstock to everyone. Um, and as you were pointing out too, the global clothing consumption, sorry, I'm looking at my notes, I just want to get it wrong, is said to jump by 63% from 62 million tons today to 102 million tons in 2030. And that's equal to more than 500 billion t-shirts. So there is so much more coming down the line, which just means there's that much more waste. And so it is time for a circular economy. And what that means is nothing ever goes to waste and it's kept in a closed loop production cycle. So it's repurposed, reused, new products again and again. So um, there's a lot of that gonna be spoken about, I think in the next panels, but it's, it's both the industry and the consumer for sure. Um, I definitely agree on that note. Um, I, think the con I think that consumers tend to be a kind of gear in the whole machine, um, of course. And what's so interesting is that I feel like there's some sort of unfinished connect the dots thing here with a lot of consumers because I've talked to a lot of people, I do a lot of public speaking and, and I speak on this uh, topic of sustainable and ethical fashion a lot. And 
something that I've come to the conclusion is that a lot of people, in a sense, kind of have their heart in the right place of, well, maybe they recycle, maybe they think about um, how they can you know, give back to the environment, or maybe they have a green lifestyle, maybe they eat vegan or organic. But for some reason, that fashion, thinking about how your wardrobe contributes to the environment, it just doesn't exist. And there's that lack of education and there's that lack of public knowledge that kind of makes that big disconnect. Um, and just with environmental issues in general, um, there are so many people all over the world of all different generations that are, you know, standing up for a, you know, for a future that, you know, generations will be able to live in, where they'd be able to have uh, uh, op equal opportunities, um, be able to thrive, but there's still that, that forgetfulness about the environmental part. And like, if you want a better future for your kids, you know, where they have equal opportunities, well, what planet are they gonna inhabit to experience that? It's, it's so strange, I see this so often that somebody might, well, I eat organic, I eat green, I eat vegan, I, I do this, I do that, I recycle. Okay, well, what's in your wardrobe? What, what, are you, what clothes are you buying? Where are you getting them from? What's the life cycle of that piece of clothing? What are you doing with the items you don't want anymore? And it's like, they've never thought about that. So I think education is a really big part of this too. I think there seems to be a really big um, disconnect with that. And I have been seeing, um, you know, slowly a growth in more people becoming educated on the, the issue of uh, the fashion and the impact it has on the environment. As you know, a lot of you may know that the fashion industry is the second largest polluter of our planet, only second to oil, which despite, you know, how long I've been in the sustainable fashion world, it's, it's still, blows my mind every time I think about that. Um, so I think education, um, and education on a massive scale, and showing how environmental issues are also human issues. I think people have had that disconnect a lot too, that oh, it's, it's hurting nature, it's hurting the animals, it's hurting the ecosystems, it's hurting everyone. It's hurting every living being that lives on this earth, whether they realize it or not. And you can't really escape it, and it will affect you, even if it's not right now, directly in a big way. So I think it's, like I, like I just said, just wrapping up, it's almost like a weird sort of connect the dots. We're still trying to connect with a lot of people and educate. And events like this absolutely help bring that education to, uh, to the world. I completely agree that it's an educational problem, also a societal problem, I believe, especially in this country. So, um, I was thinking before the panel, so should I take on the role this afternoon of the bad cop? Uh, because I think there's lots of whitewashing, greenwashing going on here, and I think we all may sit in this little bubble. And so we are talking now to you, and I assume almost everybody in the audience knows, knows the topic and knows what we are talking about, but there's hundreds and millions of people out there who have no clue. And I just read a survey of the Elle magazine in the UK that just was released last week, you know, 67% of people never have heard of fast fashion. They don't know that the fashion industry is, by the way, according to the Copenhagen summit, it's now the fourth largest polluter. So overcome by transportation and energy and heat and agriculture. That this tells a lot because I would like to address this later, maybe the whole transportation that we are living in this kind of instant get it now, we want it now society. So we are ordering stuff right now on Amazon and what impact the transportation or all these boxes that have been delivered to the front door, what an impact this has on our environment, so. But then you also have to look at the fashion industry does hit transportation energy, so even though those are up, the fashion industry encompasses so much. So, but there is always that debate of where it is in the scale, but extremely. Okay, so I sort of knew you were all gonna put responsibility on both consumers and the industry. So if you had to choose, if you had the power to suddenly sort of shift the consciousness of either consumers or industry insiders, who would you, if you, if you could wave your magic wand, who would you direct it at? I would, I would choose the consumer. 
because the consumer has, has the power to change a lot. Um, they have the power to make, of they have the, of they can, they have the ability to make an informed decision on what you want to buy in uh, what you want to wear and how you want to look. Um, but then, as a as a company, um, you are pushed into certain. Um, I will not use the words that were used uh, earlier, but you have to clean up your supply chain because they can only make informed decisions if you are transparent about what you're doing. Uh, so I think it it, ha it will be have a trickle down effect if you if if we would really put it at the consumer or the customer uh, because it has the most effect. Then companies will take their responsibility. I think in the past we've seen organizations like oh sorry you can add, you can add, like Greenpeace or some clean clothes campaign uh, who push certain companies and and it has really an effect um, uh, and there's a big uh, consumer community behind those organizations. Do you want to, I'll, I'll go ahead. Yeah. So I just think the opposite that I would <laughs> just throw it to the companies. And so there's, com there's companies like your company as well, right, who are ahead of the curve. And my favorite, absolute favorite company right now is Stella McCartney. Uh, she has always had the vision. She was always ahead of the curve. And how she's been using now, or even thinking ahead of using new, totally new materials like that have been grown in the lab. So, which I would like to address later because I think that's the future. Forget all about the recycling and polyester and blah, blah, blah. So, because it doesn't go anywhere, the new thing is really growing. Growing yarns from yeast in the lab and growing uh, biofabricated materials from collagen, etc., etc., with no impact on the environment. Agree, but that's. Okay. <laughs> Future, and but it's, it is happening now. But I mean, from from my yeah, this question was difficult for me because it's both are very much needed, right? Because we're all connected to fashion, which means we all have the power to fix it, and we all have conscious decisions we have to make every day, whether you're on the business side or on a consumer side. From Ico's perspective, we do say that um, it's on the industry. I mean, I've been an Ico eco warrior and educating the industry for over eight <coughs> years, and. The, to take product responsibility that you're selling these items to the consumer and the consumer wants to do good but they don't know what to do and so to be able to take those back and that is the beginning of circularity you have to collect what's out there and there's a lot of existing we don't even know what's in these materials that are coming from all of our closets much easier to handle the stuff that's coming on the manufacturing floor because you know where that textiles come from so to have the green wand um, that you said earlier for to really shift the consciousness of fashion brands to commit, take a bold action, start collecting, start reusing and recycling, and communicate to the consumer because they really want to know, and they really want to trust the brands to help them get there. So I'm just on the the fire lines all the time, and that's why I take it from. Yeah. The yeah, it's definitely a, a little bit difficult to just pinpoint one or the other. I do think the industry does have a, a really big hand in this because, uh, of course, consumers create demand and demand basically drives the industry, but the industry also does the vice versa. They also um, influence the demand of the consumers. And the thing is, is uh, you know, a lot of these consumers that are not informed about the about uh, issues with uh, the fashion industry. You know, it's hard for them to kind of see through the BS and, and to know, to, to really know the truth behind what they're being marketed, what's being marketed to them, um, you know, what's the hot new thing. So the, the, a lot of consumer demand is still influenced by the industry and, you know, the industry really shifts focus and it's like, you know, this can be aesthetically pleasing but it also doesn't have to have uh, it doesn't have to, uh, you know, pollute our, our water. It doesn't have to pollute our air. It doesn't have to be unethically made. And, and they like you said, communication to the consumers. Not just like, oh, we're eco now. Explain how you're eco now. Explain what the issue was. Explain what the problem is that you are solving. And thus, that's also educating the consumer about what to look out for um, in, in this case that they come across something that is against, you know, all of those um, you know, important 
uh, uh, messages. So I think the industry definitely, I think I might try to wave my, my green wand um, on the industry. Because um, the consumer, of course, does have a lot of uh, big impact. Um, you know, it's been said that if you know, if everyone stopped buying chewing gum within four weeks, nobody would be producing it anymore. And, and, and that's, that's, just, that's just really the, that just really shows you how powerful the consumer, is, the consumer demand is. But again, they're being told what they need to demand. And it's hard to just educate everyone across the board about every single issue and the life cycle of a clothing piece and the pollution. And the, there's so many different areas that I think that just changing the entire culture would thus change the consumer culture. So what are the biggest obstacles that the industry faces, in your opinion, before we can move forward? The supply chain? <coughs> yeah, I think, there are, I think there, are, there are many obstacles still and things we need to solve, but in a, in a way I think we, we first need to align and agree within, talking from the industry perspective, from the company perspective, we all need to align on, okay, we need a new textile economy or a new business model. We need to move away from linear to more circular model. Um, and then we can add in all the, uh, the elements because we, we need new materials um, that do not harm the planet. We need um, uh, different supply chains. So there are so many, um, there are many obstacles, but in a way I think we need to align on that we need that new um, system, a circular system. Uh, we need to collaborate more within our industry, within the fashion industry, all, all together. Um, and and uh, because you can't change it, just one company can't change the system and uh, and and make sure that of uh, eliminate the obstacles. Um, so yeah, I think um, first get the alignment and then the buy-in of all the stakeholders. And and to that, I think government has also is sometimes also an obstacle because they could set up certain rules and regulations to push it a little bit further. Uh, and an example was in the Netherlands where they said, okay, and uh, by 2020, all the companies in the selling in the Netherlands need to have a transparent supply chain. They need to um, uh, report out, okay, where products are made. So then the whole industry stood up and thought, oh, if we, if that's what we need to do, we can better, better join forces. And uh, and so the Dutch textile agreement was set up in the Netherlands, um, where everybody selling in the Netherlands um, needs to um, show where they're producing and. Now we've not only we're not lo only looking at being transparent and explaining where you produce, but we're also looking at all different topics within that uh, collaboration. And and Europe and definitely further along, government-wise, and supporting circular economy and putting money behind it. And so here in the states, it is definitely more difficult. So it's definitely taken on by private and um, and comes down to designers as well that you can talk about. But, I mean, I'll, I'll just talk a little on the on the obstacles from the collection, reuse, and recycling to really create this circular economy. Um, right now, anything that's collected, um, and our our big thing is take back programs. So H and M, um, Guess, Columbia, Adidas, all have collection programs, and they get it from all you all to their stores. Then we do the magic from there, but it all has to be hand sorted. So these million, you know, all this is coming to sorting facilities because they have to look at it and say, oh, is this, you know, is this rewearable? Because if it is rewearable, it should be continually worn because 700 gallons of water to make a t-shirt, why is that going into a landfill and why is that going to be shredded? Um, and you can talk further about how much for jeans. I mean, there's a lot. And in the very beginning, we talked about the water. So rewearable is most important. But then you have to look and say, oh, if it's not rewearable, sorry, it's my show and tell. Can it be just easily turned into wiper cloth? Like anything that's absorbent, take this and package it up, and this is big in you know, the building and the automotive world. So that's this next step where designers will take pieces and parts, and you've seen this, right? Oh, sorry. You know, um, lots of brands are upcycling. There's a, there's, there's a lot of definitions for upcycling, but then, then it gets down to what's that fiber. And if that fiber is 100% cotton, 100% wool, we can mechanically recycle that, and this takes it down to a fiber. This fiber is short, so it cannot be spun to go straight into another textile. But the move for the past 15 years has been the 
building world, so this is denim insulation. So Levi's headquarters up in San Francisco, San Francisco, everything in the walls is this. This is, every, you don't have to wear a mask, you don't have to wear gloves, all that's in there is for fire protection. But this is, this is great, but this is considered downcycling, meaning it wasn't made to be recycled when that building gets torn down. But it's definitely in the right direction. And there's carpet padding, et cetera. But the ultimate is to be able to respin it. So this is 20% post-consumer denim with, um, <clears throat> sorry, 20% post-consumer, 80% organic. So we have been working with partners starting six years ago to be able to take these fibers and make this happen because we need to look at the post-consumer and see what we can do with it. Very small percentage of what's being made right now is using this, but that's the future. Um, so I wanted to make sure I gave you a little background as to what's happening, because there's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of things happening, but it, it, it's not quite that circular yet. And also too, like what you were mentioning about the biofabrication, that's something that, you know, that you know, I've been really, uh, really digging more into as well, and, and new innovative textiles. Um, it's been something I've been really uh, excited about, and your show and tell was amazing. I'm just so <laughs> fascinated up here, just looking at everything. Um, but I think it's it's really too. Um, I think that you know I, I would recently did an interview and someone asked me what do you what is, to you is the definition of sustainability, and to me the definition of sustainability it starts up here it starts with a sort of eco consciousness and being conscious of what we do because everyone in this room all of us on this panel have had a positive and negative impact on the planet. That's just how it is. All of us have leave some sort of footprint behind, but it's being conscious of that footprint, saying, is there a way I can leave less of a negative footprint on this planet? Um, and I, I think that's really important because well, I th my, my favorite example to give is with the, the food industry. Um, you know, People started becoming aware of what they were eating and what they were giving uh, their families to eat. Um, and, and they wanted to shift and start eating things that were healthy, that were organic, that were vegan, that are gluten-free or non-GMO. And so thus you see that the food industry has and is still shifting to meet those, um, that consumer interest of, of wanting to do something better for their bodies and for their family to eat better. And so now they're organic or non-GMO or vegan options kind of everywhere, you know, it really almost everywhere that you look in places that I really would have never even expected. And um, of course, this, there's still a long way to go with that, but I think that's what's about to happen with the fashion industry in some way too. Um, the global eco-fiber, the global eco-fibers market in terms of um, value is estimated to be uh, by 2020, $74 billion. And, um, that's that's something that it really does show to me that there is an interest and there is a sort of move in that direction, but it's it's still it's it's still kind of hard to figure out where the little gaps are that you know is not are not getting certain groups of people on board or understanding or certain uh, leaders in the industry on board or or understanding. But there's a sort of kind of groundswell starting to happen because. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of leaders in the industry do know that this is coming and they're trying to figure out, okay, how can we start implementing this and keeping up with it? And the reason I, I chose earlier about if I could wave the green wand, either the industry or the consumer, and I chose the industry is because there, like you said, is a lot of green washing and um, it's easy to just use buzzwords and say, oh, it's this and it's that, but what's the full truth? You know, and there needs to be there needs to be a, a, a transparency and an honesty and a genuine care in the industry. And I, mean, I know that sounds kind of impossible, but it's not possible if, um, you know, if, if people like us and people that are in this room, you know, are, are able to lead and get, really get past these gatekeepers and say, this is the, the future, we care, and it will work um, economically you know, caring doesn't have to negatively impact um, our economy. I think that's what really makes the difference, and that's that's the perfect future for me that I foresee and want to somehow help create. The question is for me. The question.
questions for me, why now? So there's been companies around since the 80s uh, who try to promote sustainability, eco-friendly uh, garments and collections, and um, I know that the collapse of the uh, manufacturer of, of the fabric in Bangladesh was an initial to create more consciousness about fast fashion, etc. So I, I'm just going to throw it out. Why now? Because I read last week an interesting article about uh, the whole sustainability movement and somebody used the word gentrified sustainability. And I really like this expression and yeah, maybe we can discuss it later after the panel. So, but I'm, yeah, I'm very curious and suspicious about this whole hype that's been created now. Yeah. And I'm interested, Christine, you, you were sort of talking about this audience, and I mean, I don't know all of you, but it's true. There's, there is sort of a sense that there can be an echo chamber and that a lot of us who come to these things are the people who already care and we're already invested. So I'm interested for you all, since you all participate in these kinds of conversations a lot, what or who do you feel like is getting left out? Like what's not being talked about or who's not being invited to the table in these conversations? Uh, do you want the regular consumer, the masses out there, you know, they have no idea. So I'm sitting every day in my textile materials department. I have tours coming through almost every day. Young people, potential students from, I don't know, from all over the country and they look at me and look at the pieces that we have in the collection and they, they don't get it. They never have heard of fast fashion. They just say, oh my God, a garment made from coffee grounds or plastic uh, ocean waste. So I really, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that there's so less knowledge out there about what's really going on. And I've been doing this now for 10 years and it's not getting better. And also, I think, to um, really educating youth, not just only on the, the fashion industry, but all environmental topics, because they will be the, you know, they will be the, the global consumer, um, whether it's Gen Z or maybe a lot of millennials or even younger millennials. Um, that sort of education is, is so important because they will have the, basically the world's buying power, and you want that to be going into into a good place, into a positive direction, and to be driving the world to a, a more sustainable future. And also, too, I think something that's really um, been left out, I know that this has actually been talked about um, uh, quite a bit today, which I'm really happy about, but also communities of color uh, and really including their voices in this because, you know, people don't, uh, as, as we've seen, a lot of the, uh, the natural disasters and, and a lot of the environmental disasters we've been seeing, it really hits hardest on underserved communities and communities of color, whether it be in Puerto Rico, whether it be uh, the Flint water crisis, which is, you know, water pollution, um, and, you know, from, from, uh, from floods in Bangladesh to droughts in Guatemala, they're now climate change refugees. I mean, it, it's really crazy to, to see um, how many people are, their whole lives are, are turned upside down, their whole communities have to change their way of life because of what's happening uh, due to the, the intense pressure that we're putting on uh, our planet and on its resources. And uh, it's, like I said, it's a lot of community, underserved communities and communities of color that are really impacted the most by this. And I think being able to um, bring those people into this, these environmental conversations is really, really important. Um, and I am, that's why I'm really was also excited to participate in this because you are doing a lot of, a lot of that with this event too. I would like to add some, uh, who's, who's been left out. I think also um, schools, educational institutions, our students, our uh, upcoming designers kind of been left out. So for example, so I have these students, uh, they are thrilled about, let's say, 
the, bion, uh, the, the G Star Law uh, Ocean Waste Collection or other garments. And then they keep asking me, oh, where do I get this fabric from? How can I Im embed it, implement it into my collection? And there the problem starts. The accessibility, the sourcing. So and it seems like it's still the, the, the big companies have the monopole with the new upcoming manufacturers, you know, who create this yarn made from ocean plastics or coffee grounds or uh, mushrooms or pineapple or what else not. So, but there's no, no collaboration. So what do I tell my students? So I'm very sorry. Yeah, these are all these beautiful garments made by major companies who have the monopole on these kind of fibers, yarns, and fabrics, so this is. And I'll add on to that, I was in a panel about education at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit, and I was surprised that those that were leading the fashion design schools around the world did not really understand sustainability and how they can help their designers and their students. So there is that lack. Um, there needs to be a whole new round of, you know, teachers being trained to talk about it. But I. But there are, there's definitely resources out there. It's just d telling designers. So like Co, which is the common objective is a designer, um, designer community where you can learn more and they can help you become more sustainable. Um, you know, Study Hall and Celine is a great, but the Cradle to Cradle Product Innovations Cradle Institute yeah. and their fashion positive library is amazing. And, and they actually are going down to all the trims and everything that's non-competitive so that everybody can like have volume <coughs> to, at least, to at least make some movement. Um, and Ellen MacArthur Foundation, their design guide. So it's out there, but it's, it's floating, you know, and it needs to. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's extremely important on that side as well. Yeah, the last thing to add, and it's because I'm, I'm living in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands, I think we have most of the things, of those things are, are happening, uh, things, uh, in, of, in, in Amsterdam at the moment. Uh, we have the Fashion for Goods, who uh, supports a lot of startups. Um, we have uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation is in London, so it's also in Europe. And um, so I have a little bit of a different perspective because I see that there are a lot of aware consumers in Europe uh, and definitely in the Netherlands who are interested in buying more sustainable uh, items. Um, but I, and I, do, I do agree with all of you that there, we need more education towards the consumers, not the people in this room, but out there who don't have an ID. Um, and, and there I, I think also governments have a bigger responsibility because they have the tools in hand to, to do that and to, to in, yeah, inform bigger groups and uh, set certain rules and regulations to, to get this movement going. Um, yeah. No, I, I think, yeah, coming from Europe as well, so I know a little bit about Europe and what's going on in the Netherlands so what the Dutchies are doing is, is a, it's really quite amazing, yeah, but what's going on in this country, I mean, this is what I mentioned at the beginning, it's a whole societal mindset here in this country than it is in Europe, and look at Sweden, who has almost no waste, so they reduced their waste like to almost zero percent, you know, it's just, yeah, yeah. Then and then it's not happening here, I think, it's, we are still in kind of this mood of, you know, like, yeah, just consume and trash, and then we uh, build up the landfills, put concrete on it, and then we move to the next place, because this country is so huge, you know, we don't care where, yeah. Uh, that's what I wanted to add, that the Netherlands, of course, is a exactly. little bit smaller, though. Exactly. <laughs> so take that into so account. Yeah. And, uh, thinking about it. yeah, collaboration has come up a number of times, whether it's like G-Star working with Cradle to Cradle or talking about big companies partnering with smaller startups. I'd love to hear more from you all about what role you think collaboration is going to play moving forward in the industry and cleaning things up. Oh, it's critical. I mean, that's, that's as you met er, earlier, it, no one can do it on their own. This, 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 is, this is a big animal. Um, to, it's, a, it's a big movement. The collaborations, 
I'm excited though, and I mean, I, I always want to make these hopeful because there are so many good things happening, and the industry is stepping up. I mean, the, the global fashion agenda is something that was started by Copenhagen Fashion Summit two years ago, and now 95 companies have signed commitments that by 2020 they're going to have you know a certain part of it, they'll be doing take back programs, they'll be using reuse and recycled fibers. So there's written commitments for that. Um, the Alan MacArthur Foundation, what we've been talking about, they came out with an amazing report along with Stella McCartney in November. Um, it's the Circular Fibers report. Definitely say download it and read it. And now that there's now we're putting into initiatives and demonstrator projects to really take action on it. So there's there is probably the most movement I've seen <laughs> since I've been in the industry. Um, and you've got brand, you know, Passion for Good with their accelerator programs. H&M is going on their fourth year for the Global Change Awards, and that's where a lot of the, 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 the mushroom fibers, the algae fibers, there's a lot happening um, that is really positive. That, but it's all about collaboration. Oh, uh, academia, um, citizens, companies, every, all around. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So, but yeah, again, so it's a, still a lot of hype there, right? So we you know about the pineapple leaf fiber, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's been talked about for many, many years, and it's still a lack of accessibility. Um, people keep asking me, "Oh, where do we get this from? How? Yeah, yeah." Unfortunately, I'm sorry, it's still not commercially available. You know, I, I mean, it, no doubt, there's a lot of good things happening, but, um, and collaboration, so that's what I hope, yeah, it, it's key. Yeah, but it's key, everything has got to get to scale. That's what's extremely important, to really make a big change. And also, too, I want to reflect on what you said about um, societal um, how the uh, how the how society you know you're comparing the like the Netherlands and America and how there's just such a huge you know drastic shift and I know this because I I went to Amsterdam um, on a connecting flight to uh, Kenya and I was just blown away by like how like there was just sustainability which is kind of yeah, and it, it, it is. Like, yeah. Whoa, this is amazing. Why isn't this like everywhere? <laughs> Why isn't like this everywhere? But um, I think it is societal, and you know, going back to consumers too. I think something that's also not talked about is even though you, know, you could either think it's you can go from the industry to the government to the consumer. I think you also need to talk about people that are kind of in the the middleish part um, being influencers. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, a lot of this sort of greed and this, you know, we buy it, we trash it, we add, you know, we want more. A lot of this also comes from the idea of achieving some sort of luxury. And I think the definition of luxury specifically has been so twisted and corrupted and it doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Alux Magazine, but I have uh, contributed to Alux Magazine. I actually was also a, um, a judge for their Alux Awards that they did this year, which I was able to, um, you know, uh, look at a lot of uh, sustainable luxury brands from skincare to fashion to travel, you name it. And, um, you know, I, I've really come to the conclusion, you know, people think that luxury is, uh, I, don't, I don't know how people think that luxury is wearing something that uh, has attached to it such a life of, uh, of pain to our earth, to our animals, to the people that created it. And that to me is not luxurious and I don't think people understand that and a lot of you know these influencers are selling that to them like this is what you should strive to wear this is what you want to achieve um, and luxury to me is is thinking about the whole life cycle of the piece and how much care and how much consciousness was put into that and that really to me is like wow I'm getting something that has such a, a whole unique uh, and and, ha and um, a whole unique life to it that isn't putting a strain on the environment or the people or animals that live on it. And I think that that's something that really needs to also shift. So it absolutely, society does play a really big part in that. And um, I think influencers really need to kind of be part of this 
collaboration um, because they are, whether they know it or not, they're also gears in, in the machine. And I think the education also needs to be brought to them. Like, hey, this is something you should try out and this is something that you should use your platform to share with people. Start wearing some, start wearing a, a sustainable piece and talk about that and talk about why that's the future. Um, and I think that will shift a lot of the societal mindset of this is what luxury is, this is what fashion is. I could ask more questions, but we're running low on time. So I do want to open it up to the audience. If there's any questions, I see a hand right here. Yell it. Turn on this microphone. All right, here you go. This is awesome just because you guys brought up the um, uh, textile that's made out of, I think, fishing nets made of plastic and then they put it together and make yarn out of it and they're making textiles out of it. Um, I heard that that uh, uh, exacerbates microplastics. I'm not sure if that's, <laughs> I don't know, bullshit or, or not actually. So I was wondering if you guys know, like maybe Christine from FIDM or something, you know, textile guru. <laughs> Oh, because she knows because uh, her company works with. Uh, yeah. that no, it's, it's it's good that you, that you mention and 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 it's true. Um, um, we've made a raw for the oceans uh, collection, um, where and you already mentioned it. We, uh, we we saw a problem, a plastic problem. It's a big problem, um, and we thought, okay, m maybe that is something that we could reuse and make a new fiber recycled plastic, use ocean plastics or found on the shorelines to make a new fiber and a new fabric. Uh, so we've been doing that and we thought, okay, great, but um, we realized after um, a while, okay, we made a closed loop, but it's not a closed loop that you're looking for because indeed it does shed um, microfibers, recycled polyester can um, shed. Um, currently we're the industry is aware of that, um, and, it, and it, it, it is a challenge that the industry needs to solve. Um, and we're in the industry is testing now, okay, how, what type of uh, plastic fibers, like polyester, how much is shed and how can we solve that, like by a coating or there's look, we're, looking, we're looking at washing machine filters, you can maybe, you know, the guppy bag, uh, something that you can use yourself, you can put it, you can put all your um, uh, uh, garments from made from polyester or nylon in the guppy bag and then wash and you can see what comes out, the, the microfibers are, are captured by the <laughs> guppy bag. Um, but the thing is, we, we experimented, we thought, okay, we see a certain problem, we want to solve it, and then we, we ran into the next problem, but we, we thought, okay, next problem, now we're going to solve that, because, okay, we put a product on the market, but we have to take our responsibility, because it wasn't um, the best. Though, we still don't know if this specific product does shed, but in general, um, polyester fibers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you don't need to wash denim that much. Uh, you just wear your denim, hang it outside, don't wash it. That's the best. We have another question right here. Hi, I'm Kristen Marta and I'm a USC grad student in journalism. I was just wondering, I love what you guys are doing in the sustainable um, fashion industry, but I've noticed a lot of people will buy more fast fashion because of the affordability of it. Because so, a lot of uh, sustainable brands are more expensive to purchase. So with that being said, how can we make sustainability a more democratized thing for people that can't afford it? Uh, I just want to say really quickly, um, I actually had a conversation about this before. And um, in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, supporting the sustainable fashion movement as a young person, especially that the affordability is just not there, um, uh, just not there yet. Um, there are other ways uh, that young people can shop sustainably, um, whether it be even though this isn't directly supporting the sustainable brands, whether it be buying uh, vintage or secondhand or thrift store, going to thrift stores, and, and that that's a very easy way for for anyone to uh, to start uh, moving into a more sustainable direction with the the fashion that they wear and buy. Um, so that's something that I definitely love to suggest. 
And then in terms of, uh, all, in terms of supporting eco-friendly brands themselves, um, I think it's important too to, um, to kind of speak out on this because it's, it is really difficult and it is really, it is really frustrating like what you're saying. It's still, it's still not there yet. It's still not commercially available. It's still not affordable. And I mean, that's something that people that are, that do, that are able to afford um, a lot of these sustainable brands, I feel like it's really their responsibility to start you know, buying from those brands and investing in those brands and investing in, um, investing in those companies. But my suggestion would be just to the average young person is to you know, just do your research and start looking for vintage, start looking at second hand. Um, it's definitely a lot better than going to the mall and, you know, and, and picking up whatever is on the rack. Um, it definitely does have that, uh, uh, it is better for the environment in that sense. Um, so I think just speaking out about it and creating an awareness about it and creating an interest and stepping in those directions like buying second hand or vintage. I think we have time for one more. Uh, go green shirt, maybe. Hi, um, my name's Monique. Uh, my friend Trent and I are here today from USC as well. And so right now in fashion and sustainability, there's a huge focus on recycling uh, when it comes to take back programs and thrifting and all that, which is really great. The thing is, I was talking to my, one of my professors for sustainability and he was saying, there's a reason why the three R's are in that order. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And recycling, in a weird way, it has to be kind of our last resort because it takes, still takes so much power to do so. So I'm wondering, in the industry, what steps do you see are being taken to implement more reducing? <laughs> I mean, boy, I mean, that's... <laughs> Things throw my way. Uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly true. I mean, reduce is most important than reuse and then recycle, for sure. Um, the industry, you've got to look at, again, it's, it's always that debate. You, you maybe spend more money on a quality item that's going to last you for years and years, um, and then have those key pieces in your wardrobe, and then you buy little things on the, you know, on the outside to make you feel different. You know, I, it's hard when I talk to my son and his friends and your age because you're still trying to find your style. You're still trying to, you know, find who you are. So you can't be investing a lot, as you said earlier of that. So it's a difficult question, but um, yeah, reduce as much as you can. I think in terms of reducing from a more design standpoint, there are a lot of ways that um, you can design pieces you know, to, to, to not take as much um, waste material. You can use certain materials or fibers um, to, that, that, um, that do not create as much of a, an environmental strain and you don't have to use as much of it. They're kind of, I'm, I'm just speaking more from a fashion design standpoint. There are a lot of artistic and technical ways to reduce that I think need to be explored more. Um, that would just be uh, my answer, personally. And, and reuse and reduce kind of go together, too. So you can be restyling what you already have, just make it new. So those together um, help you reduce as well. The two cents that I would add to that as a journalist is that, like, I would see that as part of my job is trying to educate people about investing more in, in you know, like one piece that you could really live with long term, but I get why from a company perspective it's tough, right? Like in order for G-Star to continue doing amazing innovative work in sort of their sustainability stuff, they need to have a functioning company and they, they need to sell things. And I hear that from everyone. I hear that from Eileen Fisher. I hear that from Patagonia. I mean, Patagonia has been a good example of someone who's really tried to put forward the message of like, don't buy our stuff, basically. And of course that does fuel sales, but it's tricky. And you're hitting on, you're hitting on a conundrum that no one has a really great answer to. But 
Well, thank you all. That's, this is all the time that we have, but thank you so much. And